I, from the beginning, felt that the problem that our society had was that we were not making fairness and well-being our first priority. So you have to see that part of my mind. And so when I was approached uh, by the government uh, who offered me a million six hundred thousand a year back in 19, well, I guess 87, something like that, which was a great deal of money. Yeah. Um, to do research, I, I said, well, do you want me to, uh, do you want this research to be classified? And they said, oh, of course. And by that time I had been in government and held high classifications. So I understood that that's the whole other part of the story. But I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't do classified research. Because I think anything we know about consciousness that teaches us that all life is interconnected and interdependent and that we do better when we foster well-being at every level from the bacteria in your soil to the birds in the sky to all the animals on earth uh, we all do better whenever it when we foster well-being and everybody does better we do better 100%. And, and so if i learn something in doing this research i'm not going to classify it i want it to be made available to everybody and welcome to another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It is Luciano here as your host as usual. And before we get into it with our next guest here, um, I just want to remind you, the listener, uh, new uh, or uh, an old friend, an old auditory friend, regardless, if you haven't already, please, we ask you to rate, uh, subscribe, and share with your family and friends. Um, this is how we're growing. Gosh darn it, we're pretty happy about it. Uh, it we're, we keep bringing conversations that uh, intrigue us and uh, the feedback that we hear from you is, um, is motivating. So thank you uh, for tuning in if you haven't. And again, if this is your first time, welcome. And uh, we, hope, um, uh, we hope we can have you come back again. Uh, it, last note, uh, we are a charity, a uh, not-for-profit and a charity. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, liking uh, what you hear from us, by all means, just go to our website, uh, behindgreatness.org, and you can find uh, where you need to go. So here we go. Today, we're joined by Stefan Schwartz. Stefan is in uh, northeastern, one of the most northeastern parts of continental U.S. Is that correct? Can I say that? Northwestern. Oh, Northwest. Sorry, I thought I said that. Northwestern, excuse me, uh, in Washington State. Uh, Stefan is a scientist, a futurist, award-winning author. He is a columnist for the journal Explore and editor of the daily web publication SchwartzReport.net, where he covers trends that are affecting the future. For 40 years, Stefan has been studying the nature of consciousness and its role in social transformation, exceptional human performance, social outcome research trends, that are affecting the future. He is part of a small group that founded Modern Remote Viewing Research and is a principal researcher studying the use of remote viewing in archaeology. He also uses remote viewing to examine the future, and we'll talk about this as well. He's the author of more than 130 technical reports and papers, has written in numerous magazine articles for Smithsonian, Omni, American History, American Heritage, Washington Post, New York Times, as well as many other magazines and newspapers. He has produced and written a number of television documentaries and has written four books as well. The Secret Vaults of Time, The Alexandria Project, Opening to the Infinite, and his latest, The Eight Laws of Change, the winner of the 2016 Novelist Book Award for Social Change. And again, you can visit his work, him and his work at schwartzreport.net. Stefan, thank, thank you for coming on the program. My pleasure. Let's start off with this. Um, as we were talking about remote viewing and I'll give a quick background, even to the new listener. So we've had a few remote viewers already uh, on, um, on the program. Um, and we're more than happy to have you here because we've been exploring things since. So we've had Russell Targ, a friend of yours. Um, we've had Dean Radin as well from ions and Courtney Brown, um, all different backgrounds, all doing and having done their own thing. And we've been learning much more, um, about it and the effects it's had on our culture. 
you had, you ran for a while, um, one of the three main labs, if I can say that at remote viewing. So there was a, the SRI Institute, which is run by Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. Um, there was the Princeton one. I, I don't know what it's called in Princeton, but the Princeton one that ran until the mid nineties and then Mobis. Is that right? The, that was the name of your lab. Mobius. Yes. And it's the Princeton engineering anomalies research group called pair pair. Yes. I remember the acronym. Thank you. Um, so you ran, uh, you ran the, um, uh, Mobius, which was uh, one of the three major ones. So you've had a lot of experience um, in doing this. And before we touch upon that and maybe slide into it, <laughs> I want to ask you this question here, because you've said this on a few occasions. You may have said it with, uh, with uh, on one of our conversations in the past, but you said that we have an obsession, humanity has an obsession with power rather than with well-being. I feel that this has informed your this has informed your life. Well, I would put it this way, Luciano. For the past 50 years, what matters to me is fostering well-being. And the reason I say that is not just as a theory. I'm an experimentalist, and so everything that I deal with, I don't like, I'm not a theorist, I'm not a speculator. I'm not a philosopher, I'm an experimentalist. And so what I care about is objectively verifiable data. If you make a claim, can you objectively verify that with a rigorous uh, protocol to, to uh, take the data? And if you do, if from that perspective, which is my perspective, what you find out is that things that foster well-being are more efficient, more effective, more productive, easier to implement, longer enduring, and much, much cheaper. And so for the, since I was in my late teens, really, the early 20s, what I have cared about is fostering well-being because it produces objectively verifiable, better results. It, it is... I, for all those reasons I just gave, if you make choices which foster well-being, you do better. Everybody does better. And one of the things that comes out of the research that I do, or, and other people as well, is that all consciousness is interconnected and interdependent. We live in a matrix of consciousness. We do not have dominion. It's the, the Abrahamic idea that we have dominion over the earth and Basically, the earth is a kind of bank account left by a rich uncle, you know, that you can exploit any way you want, uh, is completely wrong. We live, in fact, in a matrix of consciousness. We do not have dominion over it, although we have a lot of influence in it. And um, we, ourselves, humanity, do better when we foster well-being. And what we're doing right now is not that. What we are doing right now is is serving power, greed, and profit. And when you were a young man, you had um, an awakening. That awakening brought you to this. Uh, I'm not going to say realization because that's uh, that's minimalizing it. But you know what I mean. Um, new new philosophy. Just a quick background for the listener. You had kind of a jet setting life really early on in your early adulthood. Uh, you wrote a script, so you, uh, you served in the army, uh, you wrote a script, you were doing work with Andy Warhol, uh, you moved to New York City, uh, you're going to parties and having lots of fun and making lots of money and driving fast cars. Um, uh, and then, uh, to use your words, you woke up. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, what happened? How did you wake up? Was it an instant thing? Was it is somebody somebody said something to you? What, what what happened? I went to a party that Truman Capote gave, and um, and I was a young scriptwriter, screenwriter, uh, just as you said, and and I went to this party that Truman Capote gave out on Fire Island, and I went off to the bathroom, and uh, when I came back. 
I walked by this antique Italian mirror that was hanging on the wall, and I turned and looked at the mirror. I was looking down the hall at all these rich, famous people who were at this party, and I looked in the mirror, and I, I, I can't tell you why or how. I, I, don't, I don't know. I just looked at myself in the mirror, and I said spontaneously, you are becoming an unattractive person because your values are screwed up. And I didn't know what to make of that. I didn't know where to take it. I didn't know what the problem was. I just didn't know. So I, I left. I said good night. I left the party. I spent the night on the beach. And then morning, there's a ferry that goes, or used to, I'm sure it still does, but from Far Island over to the mainland. And I went over on uh, the ferry and I, I went back into Manhattan where I was living. And I got into this, I had this lovely little 190 SL Mercedes convertible. And I got in my car and I drove back to Virginia, which is where I'm from, down in Tidewater, Virginia. And I, it's the only time in my life I have ever been depressed. I was because I didn't know what to do. I just really did not. I didn't see what I was doing wrong. I got the sense that I was doing not wrong so much as I was just unconscious. And I didn't know why. I didn't know what to wake up. I, I had grown up in a family that had no interest whatever in religion. My family, my father was an anesthesiologist, nationally known. And um, my mother was a, or had been a, a surgical nurse. They cared about medicine and they cared in a, in a way about consciousness and science because they had seen that consciousness had a role in people getting well. And I had witnessed a near-death experience, a, a young woman, a teenage girl, I had witnessed a near-death experience she had when I was 12. So that was their orientation. And they weren't, they just cared absolutely nothing about religion, never talked about it. They weren't against it. They just didn't care. Hmm. So that wasn't, that avenue didn't attract me. You might have gone down that road, but I, that didn't attract me. And so I was uh, sitting, I started a novel and, um, I was writing, but I was quite depressed. And my family had a property, which was a land grant property that had been given to a forebearer of my mother's family. My father had bought it back. So it had, you know, it was a farm. We had a couple hundred acres on in Tidewater, Virginia, right on the water. And I was sitting one day on the screened porch, looking out uh, over the uh, over the water, when I saw this couple walking in the uh, gardens. And this property had been built originally in 1653, and everybody who'd ever owned it had loved it, and so it had really extraordinary gardens. And my mother was a gardener and really liked gardening, and and so. I saw this couple walking down this crepe myrtle alley that was part of the grounds. And they didn't look like people would be in country rural Virginia. They, he was wearing a, a very smart, bespoke, gray double-breasted suit, and she was in this rather smart linen dress. And I thought, <laughs> where do, who are these people? I didn't recognize them, middle-aged couple. And I looked over where the cars parked, and uh, no car. And I looked down at the dock at the boathouse and thinking, well, they don't look like boating people. But, you know, anyway, I looked down there, no boat. So how did they get there? And they saw me at that, about that point, they saw me looking at them. And they came over to the screen porch, which ran along the whole length of the house on one side and 
And I opened the screen door and they came up and, and this woman looked at me for a moment without saying anything, which was kind of odd. Mm -hmm. And then she said, um, do you believe in reincarnation? Not, not introducing herself or asking a question or, you know, I, do you believe in reincarnation? Was that, I'd never thought about it. And I said to her really spontaneously without thinking about it, well, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about it, but it does seem rather symmetrical. And then I said to her, well, wait, 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 you know, who are you and why are you here? How did you get here? <laughs> mm -hmm. And she introduced themselves as Ed and Paula Fitzgerald. And I looked at this guy and he looked vaguely familiar. Not somebody I knew, but somebody I'd seen or something. And I looked at him and I thought about it for a minute. And I said, are you the Ed Fitzgerald who was the production designer for Magnificent Seven, which was then a very popular movie? And he said, yes. And I said, did we meet in New York at a film conference? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, yes, I think we did. We shook hands. And that gave them a kind of gravitas. They, they, I, you know, my initial reaction was, these are wackos. Right. You know, do you believe in reincarnation? You know, and, but I said to her again, um, you know, how did you get here? And she said, well, I had a dream. And um, in the dream, I saw how to get here. And when I woke up, I wrote it down and we just drove it. And I said, you had a dream? She, you know, that... She said, yes. I said, well, uh, okay, well, but why are you, why did you come? And she said, we came to introduce you to Edgar Casey. Do you know who Edgar Casey is? I said, no. She said, well, Edgar, she said, Edgar Casey is this man who could go into a altered state of consciousness and, and he could speak on any subject and, and accurately which I thought at the time sounded like nonsense. And she said to me, um, would you like to meet Thomas Jefferson? I said, yes, is he back? <laughs> and she said, yes, he is. And I had gone to the University of Virginia, which is the university that, had, that uh, Thomas Jefferson had founded. I'd been an Eccles scholar there, and so... That was quite interesting. I was saying, he's back? And she said, yes, yes. I said, how do you know that? She said, because Edgar Casey said he was, had this, this man had been Edgar Casey, or had been Thomas Jefferson. I, I mean, it was just crazy. Bizarre. Yeah. And I was just not, I was just kind of taking this all aboard without quite understanding what was going on and, and uh, just then, a car drove down the uh, this Ford station wagon, came down the, the lane. And, you know, our lane, we were, we were at the end of a 10-mile uh, unpaved school bus, school bus road, gravel road. And our lane was a mile long. So, I mean, this was not a place you got to casually. And this car came down, and, and this woman said to me, oh, that's our ride. And... Uh, give me your telephone number. So I gave her my card and and they got in the car and drove away. And I thought, what the hell just happened? I just didn't know what to make of that. And about a week later, I got a, uh, 10 days later, whatever, I got a call from a guy who introduced himself as Thomas Jefferson Davis. And he said, we'd like to invite you down for the weekend. And he gave me an address in Virginia Beach. I, I knew a little bit about Virginia Beach. It's about two hours away. And uh, from my, I was in Gloucester County. And uh, so I was, as I said, I was very depressed. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do this and find out what's going on as crazy as it all sounds. So that I got in my car. I drove down to Virginia Beach. I got down there and there was a young young man uh, up on a ladder putting a sign up for what turned out to be a, a sort of hippie leather shop. This is 1960, 
4, 65. And I said to him, I'm, uh, I'm looking for Thomas Jefferson Davis. And he said, well, he's not here right now, but Joan was is here and she's going to take you up to the ARE. And, and around the corner came this very attractive young woman about my age, beautiful lavender eyes. And um, she said, I'm supposed to take you up to the ARE. And I said, I don't know what the ARE is. So she explained to me that it was the foundation that studied the Casey material. And so we got in my car and we drove up to the library uh, uh, and she took me into the library. And along one of the walls, there was a line of, uh, from floor to ceiling of these green loose leaf three ring binder and she, binders and like school binders. Hmm. And she said to me, well, this, these are the readings. And she explained to me what she thought a reading was. Edgar Casey would go into this kind of trance, and then he could answer questions and about anything, and even speak other languages. So I just randomly walked down the wall, and at random, I pulled a green loose leaf notebook out, opened it up just randomly, and it was a reading that had been given in 1936 for a woman, and it said that she had been a teacher of astrology at what I recognized as Kerbet Qumran, the Essene community at Kerbet Qumran. And uh, Luciano, I, 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 when people talk about being stunned, mm -hmm. I understand what that means because I just stopped in my tracks. Because the last thing that I had done for national, I've been an editorial person with National Geographic, and the last thing I had done before I got drafted to go in the Army was research for an article on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I knew that in 1936, there was not a living human on Earth that knew that the Dead Sea Scrolls existed. The... Uh, no one knew that it was an Essene community where this location was. And, and it was thought, according to Josephus, who was one of the main scholars out of the ancient world, he described them as a schismatic order of Jewish monks and that no women were involved. And, and yet, in 1947, 11 years after uh, he had given this reading that nobody knew about, a uh, young Bedouin tribes boy was a shepherd, was walking along with his flock, and he chucked a rock into a cave, and he heard it go clunk. And he went down into the cave and found these urns that were filled with what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the scrolls, when they were translated, talk about this obsession with astrology and excavation at the site revealed that it was an Essene community and that there were female skeletons, so women had been involved. And I thought, I mean, when people tell you your hair can stand on end, they're telling you the truth. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to explain, but it was like a completely different reality had just shifted because I'm looking at this thing, I'm reading this. He, he's talking about this in 1936, and, and it's not until 11 years later that... that um, any of this information was even known to exist, and it turns out that everything he said was accurate. So my question was, well, where did he get this information? Where was it stored? How do you access that kind of thing? And I said to this young woman, let me take you to dinner. I, um, I have some questions. And that, what, had, what started out to be a weekend, ended up being five years. <laughs> so I, I asked just, you, I, this is sorry, sorry let, let me interrupt <laughs> i asked you what made you wake up and you gave the most elaborate intricate and almost fantastical story on awakening um but you know i'm i'm not gonna doubt that you were brought along the whole way by something and oh i absolutely i mean today i would say to you that this woman was 
had an, an intention to spread information about the Casey readings. They had recently discovered them and that somehow there was a non-local linkage, that is a linkage at the non-local level of consciousness is outside of space-time, and that that's what had driven her to make the trip, and that the dream had provided her, which I was extraordinary, had provided her with the driving instructions of how to do it. And because, as I said, that this was not a place you would get to casually. Of course. And yet somehow they had driven up two hours, um, driven by this woman's intention, and she had come down and th th their invitation to me. And, you know, I would also say to you, based on the reincarnation research that we've now done, we know that people make agreements that you choose your parents, you choose your economic circumstances, you choose your racial group, you choose your geography. I mean, if you look at the work of Ian Stevenson, for instance, or Jim Tucker now, or Erlander Harrelson, you see that what comes across from one incarnation to another is that uh, is information. Um, you're not coming back, I'm not coming back, but the eternal self, what the religion calls the soul, will episodically manifest another personality which will incarnate, and that there is continuity of consciousness. That is, your consciousness, the eternal part of you, existed before you incarnated. And again, I'm speaking entirely in science, not in religion mm -hmm. or metaphysics. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about objectively verifiable data. You choose these things. You choose when to incarnate. You bring across information and genetic programming. And I think that at some level we make agreements before we're born. I wrote a paper on unexpected messengers at one point years ago because I, I collected all these stories of people who would have a person come into their lives maybe just one time and tell them something that changed their whole life. And, and that's what happened with the Fitzgeralds. They got me started. I started reading the Edgar Casey readings. Yep. And I immediately could see the concepts that he was dealing with. And I could see because Gladys Davis Turner, his lifelong secretary and archivist, who was a meticulous archivist, she not only took down shorthand all of the readings, but she also documented them in just an extraordinarily detailed way. So if you go down to the ARE archives, you know, there's the reading, there's the letters that went back and forth. This is all pre-internet, uh, uh, yeah. telephone records. You know, and Casey would say things like, oh, we have the body, and oh, it's quite a large body, and it's wearing a striped pajamas, and I can smell uh, the uh, beautiful flowers uh, as, because the window's open. And you'd get a letter that would say, Dear Gladys, thank you very much. We got the reading that you sent us. And yes, she is a little overweight. And yes, she was wearing striped pajamas. And that day, the window was open and we could smell the forsythia as the scent blew into the window. And you'd say to yourself, how could he possibly know that? Where could he get that information? And that's how I got started. And then in 1968, I began, I became a researcher and began doing experiments. Um, I built a grid in my back garden in the house that I had in Virginia Beach. Originally, it had 12 squares, and then ultimately, I made it 144 squares because a statistician friend said it'd be much more impressive if it had more squares. And I would bury mason jars or uh, 35 millimeter film canisters into those little film canisters, and I'd put things in them. 
and I'd bury them in one of the holes in the, in the grid, and I would make a mimeograph of the grid. That's how long ago this was. Mm -hmm. And I'd send it out to people like you, and I'd say, uh, Luciano, uh, in this grid I have buried uh, something, and can you please locate for me which of the grid squares I and into which grid square I have buried this. So you've got a, a grid of 144 squares, right? And I discovered that people could do it. They could pick the hole, and the, statistically that's very significant. What, what, was the, pick, what was the hit rate that you found? When you say people could do it, what, uh, what was the hit it? rate of their ability to pick the right square? Yeah, yeah. Um, more or less. It's about 75%. Across it's the board. Quite, it, how many people yeah, did I mean, you... I had, I had hundreds of people do this, and then I would ask them, okay, you've located it. Now please describe for me what's there. And I, to give you an example, I, my, I, I, I got married, and, and not to that woman, but another one, another wife, and, and my wife... Uh, uh, had on her dressing table a, a little those little perfume bottles that had little squeezy knobs <laughs> that made an aerosol, right? So I had I had put one of them in a mason jar and buried it. Just to give an example, and I had asked people to if, if they could locate this. Now they're they're not doing it together. They're scattered all over the world. I'm sending this out by mail, and and. They des described, they picked the right square, and then they would say, well, there's something in the, in the mason jar. I don't know. It has a flowery scent. Smells like flowers. Amazing. And um, there's something you squeeze. So they wouldn't get what it was, but they could get the sense impressions of color, taste, smell, that kind of sound, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I did this over and over and over again, and I discovered people could do it. And I started it because Edgar Casey had said other people could do variations of what he was doing. And I called this distant viewing. Uh, it, and that's how I got interested. This is in 1968, and that's how I got interested. I didn't know anybody else who was doing it. No one, no one was doing it yet. SRI yeah, before Russell exist. Targ and SRI. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's before SRI. It's before PAIR. As I said, I called it distant viewing. And because I had been interested in anthropology I and archaeology, uh, at that time, this is the late 60s, one of the big issues going on in archaeology was where to look because most archaeological sites were found uh, serendipity, okay. serendipitously. Let me, let me interrupt, Stefan, because the, what you were about to uh, describe also blew my mind. I, before we get there, because I, I want to... <laughs> it, it's, just, it's just so fascinating, it, the, what you have lived and what you have been studying and what you've been doing. Um, you, had, you had started to do this before there was any military application in the U.S. on this before uh, the governments, at least in the U.S., found out that this is something. And yeah. you, you decided throughout your life that you were never going to be, you were never going to accept an offer, even, even though you were offered um, uh, an opportunity to do this under classified conditions with the government, because to uh, your philosophy is that this is public information and this should be accessed by everybody. My feeling from the very beginning was the problems that we, uh, you, you have to also see this Luciano within the context of what I, who I was and what I was doing. I had gotten involved with the civil rights movement as a teenager. I'd actually become aware of racial prejudice when I was a little boy, nine, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But in any case, from the very, from my, from my, uh, I guess I was probably about 17. I got interested in the civil rights movement because I thought it was very unfair to, to, to be prejudiced about skin color. It didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So I, from the beginning, 
felt that the problem that our society had was that we were not making fairness and well-being our first priority. So you have to see that part of my mind. And so when I was approached uh, by the government, uh, who offered me a million six hundred thousand a year back in nineteen, well, I guess eighty-seven, something like that, which was a great deal of money. Yeah. Um, to do research, I, I said, "Well, do you want me to? Uh, do you want this research to be classified?" And they said, oh, "Of course." And by that time, I had been in government and held high classifications. So I understood that that's the whole other part of the story. But I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I won't do classified research. Because I think anything we know about consciousness that teaches us that all life is interconnected and interdependent and that we do better when we foster well-being at every level from the bacteria in your soil to the birds in the sky to all the animals on Earth, uh, we all do better when every when when foster well being and everybody does better. We do better, 100%. and and so if I learn something in doing this research, I am not going to classify it. I want it to be made available to everybody. And they said, "Well, unfortunately, we can't do it that way." See, it, one could argue the fact that uh, th this. I'm, it's not even a phenomenon because it's uh, I'm I'm beginning to believe this is this is it just is this is existence. Um, if you if you were if you were employed by defense strategy institutions, you would want to protect the information that you are learning. Um, so I, I understand that, but this is something more than what defense is about. This is something that can inform us about <laughs> about the realities of information well about who we are yeah yes exactly oh no i understood classification as i said i held classifications the names of which are classified so i can't even tell you what they were sure but i will tell you this top secret is just the beginning mm. Right? So I understood about classifications. I understood why things had to be kept secret. I didn't have any trouble with that. That I mean, I understand what that's about. But I felt that anything about consciousness that would help human beings understand who they were and their place in the matrix of consciousness ought to be made available so that other people could integrate it into their lives and I just was not willing to learn something about consciousness that I couldn't share. And so then let's go back to archaeology, because you were sharing it with the world, and you were sharing it uh, through one of your collaborators who is just an average guy in British Columbia, Canada, who could help you find things that were hidden for thousands of years. Is that Well, I, had, I developed a, a group of people... <laughs> Yeah, I developed a group of people. The man you're referring to is a guy named George McMullen, who was a parts manager at a Chrysler dealership in Nanaimo, Canada. He's gone now. Uh, as I said, I was, because I had come out of an anthropological background, I got very interested in anthropology and the, and, and the anthropology of consciousness. And through that, I met a man named Norman Emerson, who was the father of Canadian archaeology. And he introduced me to George. But what got me started was I began looking around for, I looked at, after about three years of, of while I was reading the Casey readings, and I just read them all in order. I just started with the first one and just kept at it. And I had enough money from my screenwriter period in New York that I didn't have to take a job. So I, what I did was I just studied this stuff. And then about three years in, I thought I better learn what science has to say about this. So I did the same thing I'd done with the readings. I started with the very first parapsychological journal. And um, 
and just began reading parapsychology journals. Uh, there are a number of universities that were near me, and so I would go to their libraries, and you know they would have some would have this, and others would have that. But so that's what I did for basically five years. I just read all of the Edgar Casey readings, Rudolf Steiner, Blavatsky, Gurdjieff, Uspensky. You know, all of the 19th century, early 20th century consciousness people. And and uh, because I, I wasn't interested, I, I, I wasn't affiliated. I guess maybe that's the way to put it. I didn't affiliate with anything. I was just interested in the data. And it became, and I was thinking about how to design a protocol that would uh, uh, that would be impervious to the criticisms that I saw being aimed at parapsychological research. Because in the parapsychology journals, I realized almost all of the experiments were just about, is this stuff real? That is, can you get better than a 0.05, P equals 0.05 value? And all the experiments were basically designed just to prove whether it existed. And they were always being criticized. Oh, you're, you knew the answer. And so some you changed your facial expression or they drilled a hole in the ceiling so that you could cue people. I mean, just all kinds of nonsense. And I decided if I'm going to be do this, if I'm going to be an experimentalist, I want to do experiments which are impervious to that kind of nonsense. And archaeology uh, attracted me because, as I said at that time, the big question in archaeology was where to look. And so I thought, well, like my grid in my back garden, if I could get people who could locate a previously unknown archaeological site... And if they could describe not only where it was located, but what was there when you went to look for it, and it all turned out to be accurate, that was a pure triple-blind experiment. And that's the most rigorous kind of experiment you can conduct. And it was also a precognitive experiment because people were describing where something was located and what would be there when you went there, and they were doing it before you went there. So it was precognitive. So the information that was being provided by the, the participants, the, the remote viewers we would say today, that information was absolutely um, unimpeachable as in some way they read up on it, they got cued on it, Sure. or they read your mind or, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. This was this was the most rigorous protocol I could think of because that's what I cared about. And for 50 years now, over 50 years, almost 60, what I have done is triple blind experiments so that there are no alternative explanations to how this information could be obtained except that people accessed non-local consciousness. You were able then to find real artifacts in North Africa. Yes. Oh, all over the place. Um, I started out, the first one we did was locating the talking idol of Ixchul, which, is a, uh, which was a Mayan oracle uh, on Cozumel Island. Then the, the big question, the other big question in parapsychology at that point was, is this an electromagnetic phenomena? And most people thought it was. And so when you go back and read the papers from that period, you see lots of arguments about, you know, what part of the electromagnetic spectrum could this be? And they would put people in Faraday cages. And in 1969, uh, my wife got pregnant. And I uh, had pretty much gone through all the money that I had made in New York, so I didn't. I needed to get a job of some kind. So I went back to Washington, which was the one city where I knew people, 
And I became the editor first of a magazine called Sea Power, the largest of the naval maritime journal magazines. And then I became the special assistant. I was invited to become the special assistant to the chief of naval operations. And while I was doing that, and because I held these clearances, I got briefed in on um, something called the ELF project or Project Sanguine. The Navy was interested in um, communicating with the missile submarine, the deep ocean ballistic missile submarines, and they didn't want them to have to surface because if they surfaced, then the Soviet satellites would pick up where they were located. And they didn't even want them to get close to the surface because then the heat from the nuclear reactors of these submarines could be picked up by the infrared detectors in the Soviet satellites. Yep. So they wanted to keep the submarines deeply submerged. And they, the Navy spent about $125 million at that time, I mean, imagine what that would be today. That'd be about, well, getting close to a billion. And, um, and figuring out how deeply will electromagnetic radiation penetrate seawater. And at about this same time that I was being read in on, these, on the, this project, um, a, head, a friend of mine had become the head of the CIA guy named Stansfield Turner, and he began to send me translations of the papers of a man named Leonid Vasiliev, who was a researcher in uh, then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. And he had been asked uh, by the Soviet Politburo to do research in consciousness. And again, they thought it was electromagnetic. And so he put people down into caves and down into mine shafts, and he put them in Faraday cages. He built down in the mine shafts and the caves, and he got them to do non-local consciousness tasks, describing things, and they were able to do it. And so he wrote a series of papers, which I got translations of, they had not been declassified. They were classified at that point, uh, uh, but they were de I got them, and uh, they were later, or at least some of them, were later put into a book, which uh, uh, a series of books that Russell Targ uh, published. Anyway, Leonid Vasiliev was a very meticulous researcher, and he had gradually gone through the whole EM spectrum and decided that uh, it had had to be what's called ELF, three to 300 hertz. This is a very long wave form of electromagnetic radiation. And a researcher in Canada, a guy named Michael Persinger at Laurentia University, also a good researcher, he had published a paper, I think it's like 72, in which he had argued that it was in fact ELF. But, uh, and, and Vasiliev, who wanted to test the ELF hypothesis, he went to Admiral Gorshkov, who was the father of the Soviet Blue Water Navy, ocean-going Navy, to ask him if he could do an experiment in, in a submerged submarine. But for whatever reason, Gorshkov wouldn't do it. I don't know why. So I got this, and I'm getting these reports that, that I'm being given. And I thought, well, um, you know a guy. <laughs> I, I I I knew Hyman Rickover, who was the father of the American nuclear navy, a, a deep ocean navy. Mm -hmm. And I happened to fly up to Groton, Connecticut, once on with John Warner, Secretary of the Navy, and um, and Rickover was on the plane. And I asked him if I could do this experiment, which Gorsh, which Vasilya wanted to do, but was never able to do. And he said, well, let me think about it. And then he called me about 10 days later, something like that. And 
And he said, do you know that experiment? That's a, that, that, I said, yes, of course. He said, well, it's a very interesting experiment, but I'm not going to do it. I said, why not? And he said, well, because inevitably it will leak out to the media and there'll be coverage about it and they'll be talking about the deep ocean missile submarines and we just don't want that. We prefer that not happen. And I understood that because the, the, most Americans don't even know these subs exist or that cruising around all over in the world ocean are these American submarines that have missiles. It's part of what's called the nuclear triad and along with planes and ground-based missiles. And he said, we just don't want to talk about it. So I'm sorry, I just, I'm not going to do it. And I thought, well, it'll never happen then. But that was in 1973, I think. And then uh, four years later, um, I had left government to go do full-time research. And I had been offered a fellowship out in Los Angeles. And I went out to LA to, to be interviewed by the board of this foundation. And I stayed with a friend of mine, a, a guy named Don Keach, who had, was, had been the deputy director of Navy Labs, and his friend Don Walsh, who made the deepest dive that's ever going to be made on Earth, in the Mariana Trench and the Challenger Deep. And and he, I was we had lunch one day, and he said to me, you know that crazy experiment you wanted to do with the submarine? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we've got a submarine that's coming out coming down from Canada from a company called Heiko, and they have this research sub and they want to do their sea trials using our Catalina Island facility as a base. And we'll pay for three days to let you do that experiment. Amazing. You know, because, I mean, I don't know what it would have cost, $100,000, three days of a submarine and a surface ship and all the people and blah, 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 you know, all that. That became Project Deep Quest. And I tested it in two ways. One, I wanted to see if people could penetrate the seawater down to uh, locate a previously unknown wreck on the seafloor, because I knew that if they could do that, that they were going deeper than the Navy, which had spent all this money studying ELF, that that... that they that couldn't be possible using ELF, and then to put people in the submarine and get them to reach out to where people were hiding in Northern California, 500,000 miles away, and describe where they were, just like the grid experiment I'd done. And if they could do those things, then that would answer the question, is this electromagnetic in nature? And it would also be an example of locating a previously unknown wreck on the seafloor and describing in detail what would be there. And I made a film out of it so that there'd be no question about what happened. They could find that on your website too, right? Your yes, website. you can go to my personal website, stephanaschwartz.com. And you just, it's right there. Look for Deep Quest. And I got Leonard Nimoy, Dr. Spock to do the narration for me. And that started these experiments that I've been doing ever since. You also filmed, uh, or so you wanted to film, or you filmed part of it. Excuse my uh, my lack of memory on this, but I took some notes. Um, going back to your archaeology, uh, George McMullen, who you had mentioned earlier, who uh, from Nine Ammo yeah. BC, um, he mentioned to you that he he thought or he viewed the bones of Alexander the Great. Oh, well, that's part of a much larger experiment. Right. So that's, I did the Deep Quest experiment in 77. Yep. In 79, two women historians approached me and they were interested and had been studying Alexandria, Egypt and Alexander the Great. And they said to me, um, could you locate the tomb of Alexander? And I said, well, I don't know, but, you know, maybe I'm willing to try. Do you have the funding to do it? And they said, yes, we have the funding to do it. 
And that became the Alexandria Project. And that was a two-year project in Alexandria, 79, 80, 81, actually almost three years, in which uh, we located Cleopatra's Palace, Mark Anthony's Palace, the Timonium, uh, the Lighthouse of Pharos, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Amazing. Amazing. We located the tomb of Alexander. I, I, I think we, we were not f fully able to excavate that. And uh, because the University of Alexandria, which uh, was involved with it, I had five universities involved with this. All of which had the knowledge that uh, you were you were using remote viewing to locate. Yes. Okay. This yes. is what's not public Actually, knowledge. The, Ridiculous. Sorry. The most interesting was, um, I, I was just about to say, one of the pro parts of the protocol that I do is that before we do the test of the remote viewing data, we do an electronic survey. That is, could you locate the same thing using an electronic system? Mm -hmm. That's just another way of settling the issue. Is this result the result of non-local consciousness, or could they have detected it in some other way? And so, to give you an example of that, I uh, wanted to. Have, I finally got permission to um, dive in the Eastern Harbor, which was where the remote viewers put Cleopatra's Palace and Mark Anthony's Palace and something called the Pompey's Pillar and the Lighthouse of Pharos. And they put all this underwater, which was kind of strange because that was not in accord with what most archaeologists believed. And, um, and so I wanted to know, yes, could you, could you find this same stuff using side scan sonar? So where to go? Well, my... My uh, approach to getting people involved is I only go to the very top. I'm only interested in the very top class scientists because second and third tier scientists are more concerned yeah. with their status and with their acceptance by their peer group. Thomas Kuhn in Structure of Scientific Revolutions describes this very clearly. So I wrote... I, I sent a telex. That's I don't even know that they exist anymore, but this is way before the internet. Mm -hmm. I sent a telex to Harold Edgerton, chairman of the Department of Radio Physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the most famous scientists in America at that point. And I, I didn't know me from Adam's house cat. And I sent him a telegram and said, I'm doing this remote viewing um Actually, I called it distant viewing. <laughs> Remote viewing is a term coined by Ingo Swan. Uh, it's a terrible term, by the way, as is distant viewing, because it has nothing to do with remoteness, has nothing to do with viewing. But in any case, that's where our understanding was in the beginning. What terminology Anyhow, do you prefer, though, so, Stefan? What terminology do you prefer just for the listeners? Oh, I would say non-local perception now. Okay. Understood. Anyway, so I wrote him and said, I'm doing this distant viewing thing. And I explained a little, you know, telexes, you couldn't, if they weren't very long, you couldn't explain too much. Anyway, so I explained what I was doing. And I said, I'd like to have a, an electronic survey before I do my field work. So would you come over and do that? Now, this is a man I don't know. He's one of the most famous scientists in the world. He's He's at one of the most prestigious universities in the world. I also went to Peter Fraser, who was at Oxford University, who was the leading authority in the world on the history of, of Alexandria. And I had Michael Rajayevich from the University of Warsaw, who was the leading archaeologist at that time, and Mustafa el who was the chairman of the Department of, of Anthropology at the University of Alexandria. So I had all these guys who were evaluating the accuracy of what I was doing and witnessing it. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, I, I confess to you, Edgerton wrote back and said, well, if you can do it between these dates and you give me a first-class ticket and put me up in a first-class hotel, I'm your man. So I said, well, we can do that. 
and he did. And so he came down and he did uh, the side scan sonar survey of the Eastern Harbor. He didn't find anything. Uh, but we found all these things and then we dived and, and we found them, and located them, took pictures of them. And I made a film out of that and you can go to my website and uh, watch the film. And also, because the University of Alexandria just thought the whole thing was complete nonsense. And I had gone to Governor Hilmy, who was the uh, governor of Alexandria, the second most important off elective office in the country, and asked him if I could have permission to dive in the Eastern Harbor. And the University of Alexandria objected. They didn't want me to do it. So we had a meeting in, in his office, in Alex, in Mohammed Hilmi's office, Governor Hilmi's office. And I said, well, you know, what would it take you to uh, get me? I, I said to him, what would it take to get permission to do this? And he looked at these guys from the Alexandria and University of Alexandria, and he said, well, you know, what would what would it take? And they said, well, we're, uh, we're just beginning an excavation of the buried city of Maria, about 40 kilometers west of, uh, of uh, uh, southwest of, of Alexandria. And if he could locate something that we want to find, and, and it was actually successful, which of course it won't be, um, then we would we'll give permission. We'll go along with your giving him permission to dive in the Eastern Harbor, and so um, we agreed. And a guy named Fauzi Fakarani, who was doing the dig at Maria, was the guy they assigned. So on the appropriate morning, um, I, I, they didn't have a map, so I couldn't do the. Usually, I do a map, and then we do the location to fine tune it. But they didn't. They didn't have a detailed enough map. So we just had to go directly to the fine tuning. So we drove out uh, into the desert. It's, I mean, we're talking desert here. Mm -hmm. It's about, oh, I think it was 1,700 square kilometers. So it's a very large area. You know, it's hundreds of square miles. <clears throat> we get out of the car and, and we kneel down and George is with me and, and Hella Hammond. And Hella goes off by herself, so she doesn't see what George is doing. And we, so George and I sit down, and you can watch this in the movie with Fakarani. And he says, I'm looking for something that has a, a buried building, multiple rooms, and something that has tile or mosaic. And um, I want you to locate it. And George says, okay. I mean, really, you know, okay. Sure. <laughs> so we walk around for a couple hours. And I mean, you know, this is, we're talking about hundreds of miles. <laughs> we were walking around. It's about 114 degrees. And finally, George says, okay, I know where I want to go. I say, okay. So we go back. to Fakarani is trailing us with about a dozen graduate students. And you can hear them snickering the whole time. They just think the whole thing is so absurd and so uh, I'm going to be made such a fool of. And, and, you know, I can hear them talking behind me. Anyway, we kneel down and George says, OK, this is where I want to go. And he draws a little map in the sand. And he says, yeah, and you're digging here, right? And Fakarani says, uh, well, uh, yeah. And George says, okay, well, that's where I want to go. So we get, we go down and we get back in the cars and George directs us. And Fakarani's in his own car and his graduate students are in cars behind that. And I'm in the car with George and our driver, Syed, and, and George, just go down. And, okay, keep going. Okay, now turn left. Okay, now turn right. In the sand. And we, okay, stop here. So we stop. And we get out and we walk up this little hill and we're walking along the little hill. And you can see this in the film. George 
<laughs> and they're all walking behind us, and I've got a film crew that's filming the whole thing. And George says, okay, I'm walking over a wall. I said, you're walking over a wall? He said, yeah, yeah. It's about three to four feet down. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, what do you see? Oh, well, there are three rooms. And um, in the furthest room, uh, there's this red, white, and black tiles. And they're smooth on one side, and they have white plaster on the other side. They're about this big. That's about, oh, maybe seven-eighths of an inch, right? Out of hundreds of square miles, this that's guy is talking thinks. about stuff that's less than an inch. So, okay. So we record all that. It's all filmed. And I, they're snickering away behind me. So we George leaves, and they, we bring Hella in. And Hella, at this point, is getting uh, uh, sunstroke. She's not feeling at all well. Sorry, just a side note for the listener. Hella Hammond is a photographer, but also a remote viewer, even with uh, Russell Targ's group at S uh, SRI. Yes, yeah, okay. she started as a... Russell brought her in. He was a friend of Russell's. He brought her in. She was going to be the control because she didn't think she could do it. She turned out to be very good at it. Anyway, so we bring Hella in, and she walks around for a little while, and she picks the same spot George picks. So Hella's sitting there in the sand. It's 114 degrees. I'm sweating. Everybody's sweating. You know, I mean, it's really hot. I just want to emphasize it. These are not optimal conditions. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, there are three rooms. Oh, and in the center room, there's this big column. And there's something odd about it. It's not from the same time period. And it, it got hot. They did something that made it hot. And um, it's in the center. You'll find it. It's, and this is a Christian building, which also George had said. This is Christian. And... Um, uh, several groups of people have lived here. Anyway, so she says her thing, and and so she leaves. Now she's quite sick because she's been sitting in the sun. So they take her back to the hotel. George comes back, and I get a bunch of wooden stakes, and I say to George, George, can you stake out this building you're talking about? He said, sure. So I give him the stakes, and he puts them in the ground, the corners. I said, put them in the corners of the building. I mean, the corners are the really, you know, if you think about it, corners are really the clear, the clear definers. Yeah, yeah. He also says it's a Christian building and talks about these little tiles. And uh, then he goes back, and fuck Ronnie comes over to me and said, I'm really sorry. Sorry, <laughs> this is going to be very embarrassing. The University of Guelph did a ground penetrating radar uh, so, uh, uh, and sonar survey of this area, and there's nothing there. So it's completely wrong. And even if there were anything there, it wouldn't be Christian. So I, I'm really, I'm sorry for you. This is, and this column thing, I, you know, that's just nonsense. So I'm, I said, okay, we're going to do the dig anyway. So we start doing the dig. It takes six weeks. So he held on to beliefs, just as a side. He was holding oh, on absolutely. to beliefs. He thought right. the whole thing was crazy, that there was nothing was going to be found, mm -hmm. that it had been surveyed by the University of Guelph. They had published a paper yeah. saying exactly what they found and where they found it and where at the place that George and Hella had picked, there was nothing. And um, you can go to academia.edu or researchgate and get the papers. I published these papers. So you can get the paper on the Eastern Harbor. You can get the paper on Maria. Anyway, so we dig down at, at just over three feet, between three and four feet, just exactly as predicted. 
the walls appear. So that kind of freaks everybody out. They stop snickering. And we keep digging. <laughs> and we get down a little further. And in the middle room, this big clay column emerges, exactly as Helen describes. And one of the Bedouin says, oh, it's an oven. Nice. I said, what do you mean it's an oven? Oh, we build these clay, clay columns, and then you build a fire around them, and the clay gets very hot, and the women put uh, the dough the, the, uh, yeah, on these the columns, and it bakes it, right? Exactly as Hella said. It. She said, whatever it is, it gets hot, and it was built by later people, but there's something about it that gets very hot, and it's clay, and it's, you know, it's... It's this tall column thing. Well, there it is. Okay. Now it's getting really, <laughs> they're having a very hard time. We get down even further and there are the tiles. Now, George said, most of them have been taken away. They have been, but there are still a few there. And by God, there are still a few there. So we find these red, black, and white, exactly as described, smooth on one side, polished, white plaster, subflooring surface on the other side. And we keep digging down a little further, and we get to the <clears throat> foundations of the building, and there are the Christian concentra consecration marks. Incredible. It's a Christian building. The tiles are there. The building's exactly where he, he's 28 inches off out of 1,700 square kilometers <laughs> and describes details at the site that are less than an inch. And I, I, I want to put in the show notes, I want to put the, um, the the link to your article as well in ResearchGate, referencing this for the yeah, listener. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, we yeah. can do that. That's great. Sure. That's great. Anyway, the whole thing is exactly where it is. <laughs> And as a result of that, we go back to Governor Hilmy, and, and he says, what happened? And they have to explain and acknowledge what happened. And he said, you have permission to dive in the Eastern Harbor. And that's how we found all the other stuff. Bang, bang. <laughs> so you, you mentioned, just to go back to uh, Thomas Kuhn, this is something that we talk about with some, uh, actually with many a, many a past guest uh, about science and scientism um, and um, incrementalism um, because beliefs are so strong. So you, you quoted him when you, when you started to talk about uh, going to the top. You like top-tiered scientists because the second, third-tier scientists are more, uh, they're more worried about their peer group and being accepted in their group rather than making or heading towards a revelation. And that's what you and I talked about last time about revelation. And, yeah. and it, it makes sense. Yes. Every, everything starts with a revelation. And uh, yes. in, in humanity's experience, the people revealing usually at first are not lauded. No, that's right. And if you talk to top tier people, Luciano, you find out, for instance, I may have already told you, I was walking across uh, with Jonas Salk across the Salk uh, Institute campus. They have this lovely campus down in Southern California. And I said to him, my father had been friends with Albert Sabin, who had discovered, uh, done the original polio vaccine, a dead vaccine, and then Salk had discovered the one that we ultimately began to use. And I said to him, where did you ever get the idea for that? He said, in a dream. And if you actually, if you, if you read the biographies, the correspondence of people who are considered historically significant innovators, whether they're scientists or spiritual pilgrims or remote viewers, what you discover is that they all go through the same process. It's a whole other story. 
They all go through the same process. It's a six-step process. Oh. <laughs> and they and they open to non-local consciousness. And that that's the source of the creativity. And they all tell you that. Brahms, Beethoven, Mozart, they all tell you, I go into an altered state of consciousness, and in that altered state, I hear the music, and I just write it down. Seeing the math, seeing the music, hearing the music, yeah. Yes, yeah. Leonardo says, I stare at the wall, a particular wall, and it had this drainage of stains on it. And in those stains, I, I suddenly see something. Descartes says, I have three dreams in Ulm, Germany in 1619. And that is the foundation of my mathematics. Um, Einstein says, I was I I got sick and I when I got well I was whiling away an afternoon in a canoe when uh, I suddenly saw how relativity worked. I mean, just over and over. I mean, I just give you endless examples of this. They're all doing the same thing. It's that they they do it in their own context. So scientists see scientific things. Artists see artistic things, musicians yeah. see or composers see, hear music. Uh, spiritual pilgrims have altered states of awakened consciousness. Remote viewers describe the teacup hidden in the closet next door. Hey, Stefan, let's let's take a, let's uh, let's cut a line in the sand. Not to, no pun sure. intended. No pun intended. Um, because I want to continue this. And there's there's still a lot of meat on this bone. Um, and a, as a foreboding, you know, I, I want to talk about your ideas on creativity. Uh, I want to talk about the queen, a little bit on the queen, still Alexander the Great, um, reincarnation, ETs and culture. I like th those fi five things off the top of my head in my note and in my notes that I want to hit. Um, so if you don't okay. mind, let's. Let, let's do this. Uh, let's let's do again next week to do a second half of this conversation. It, it, this is incredible. I, I, thank you for your time already. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and share with your friends. And consider donating to help us produce more great conversations at behindgreatness.org slash donate. Until next time. <laughs>